there and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. Hallelujah. As we continue on in our study, looking, we've been studying about ministry, the call to ministry, because every believer has a ministry. And last week we were talking about having the mind of Christ, the right attitude to serve, to minister. So we're going to continue on in that. We had talked about, we had talked about the, the, the three things leading up to this, mm-hmm. which was um, the, God's purpose. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> God's purpose, praise, the price you pay for this, the power, that's the three. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which yes. led us to talking about perspective, just as we ended the, the broadcast last week. So we're going to pick this up again and look at what it means to have a godly perspective of things. Before we do that, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together. Oh Lord, we just thank you for your presence here. You said that you will be, when two or three of us are gathered, you, you will be in our midst. And we just thank you for that. We also thank you for your word. Well, you are the word too. But we just thank that we can study, we can study, to study it and with your Holy Spirit, just dig out what we need and apply it to our lives and in the hope of loving other pe- people to bring them to you. Amen. Amen. Okay. So as I say, we talked about when you, when you are walking in the power of God, that will change your perspective, right? Perspective is the way that you see things. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. What I've been teaching comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians. And I've mentioned this in the last couple of weeks, that it was all from Paul, all from his letter to the Philippians, and all seven things that we focus on start with a P. Mm-hmm. That, that purpose, that praise, the uh, price. price, the power, and now leading up to the perspective. Keeping it simple, all right? Amen. But the Apostle Paul himself, think of this. Think about his perspective. Mm-hmm. Prior to his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, he was so religious, right? Yes. He, 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 he was a Pharisee See, among the Pharisees, Pharisees, right? Yes. He was so religious that the Lord had to blind him to show him the truth. Mm. Okay? Yeah, Talk about true. how you see things. So I'm just going to read Philippians 3, start verse 4, to 4, 5, and 6, all right? This is Paul talking. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. So, This was his perspective of his life, right? Mm -hmm. But somewhere along the line, thinking about, I I don't imagine there were too many people alive that had a better knowledge of Scripture than the Apostle Paul. Now, you you can have a knowledge of the Scripture and not know the Word. That's true. I mean, that's obvious from the fact that the Pharisees who were literally expert in Scripture, Mm -hmm. didn't recognize the Word when he walked through their midst. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's all about perspective, how you see things. But Paul would have certainly read this verse in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things He has done for you. Right? Now, I I wanted to talk about that word consider. There's a difference between just glancing at something, looking at something, and considering it. Mm -hmm. That means that you're appraising it. You're you're looking at it intently, pondering. Pondering. Yes, yeah. it's not just a quick glance. Mm-hmm. It's not just oh, I saw it, but you know, it's it about right out of your head. Right. It's yeah. about considering. Is a, to give it real deep thought. So now, Paul had this perspective, but religion is about believing that the Lord should consider the things that you've done. Mm. That's a religious belief. Yes. Yeah. That you, you want God to consider the fact that, oh yeah, I tithe. Yeah. Oh yeah, I went to church every Sunday. Oh yeah, you know, I sang in the choir, I did this. That's what religion is, trying, trying to believe that God's going to consider what you've done. 
But salvation is a free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. A righteous relationship, that, and that's what we're to consider, mm -hmm. the great things that he has done. Amen. It's not about getting him to consider the things we're doing, but we're to be considering the great things he has done. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16. Mm -hmm. Is there anything greater? No. No greater. No greater gift. There's, there is no greater thing that God has done for us than to give his only begotten Son. Mm -hmm. Without that, there's no salvation whatsoever, right? So, serving him, ministry, in truth, and with all your heart, as it said in 1 Samuel, right? Will cause everything you do to be a blessing. When you're doing, when you are serving God mm -hmm. that way, everything you do is going to be a blessing to you. Trying to serve the Lord out of religious obligation will make everything you do a chore, a burden. Yes. All right. A labor that you hope will earn you God's favor or God's love. All right. To serve the Lord. Out of religious obligation is, is a terror. It's bondage. Paul knew what a sinner he was. He called himself the foremost, the chiefest of sinners in 1 Timothy 1.15. Mm -hmm. But then the Lord showed him that, here's what he wrote, Paul wrote in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In him, he wrote to the Ephesians, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. When you consider the great things God has done, all of a sudden your relationship is based on his grace, his amazing grace. Religion struggles to try and create that relationship based on what you're doing, all right? What all of his background, study and works, it was only the amazing grace of God that gave him a relationship with the living God. And what a re wonderful relationship that was. Because it goes on in Romans 8, and I believe that his understanding of that verse, coming to understand that verse in 1 Samuel, is what gave him the understanding that he wrote in Romans 8. For all who are being led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Romans 8, 14 to 16. So Paul went out, he said it was about boasting. I boasted I was a Pharisee. But now what he's, and I, I'm boasting in, what he is rejoicing in is that he's a child of God. I mean, you can, be, you can be the most religious person and you'll start boasting about all of the religiosity that you do, all the religious things. But that's not what it's all about. What it's about is being a child of God. And delighting in it. And delighting in it. Yeah. I mean, how many, how many guys have that, or women, you know, in ministry, have that on their, on their business card? A child of God. Uh, just a child of God. I can remember years ago, I was preaching over in North <laughs> Wales. Remember that? Yeah. And the, the fellow that had arranged this yes. was introducing me. And he, when he started to introduce me, he said, well, now here's a man of God, you know, Alan McDaniel. And I got up and I said, you know, I'm a child of God. That's, that's what I am. That's what I am, a child of God. Children have no right to boast in, because it's about what their parents have done, the great things that our father has done, Right. So, I, as I said, I believe I truly believe that Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8 were a result of Paul not just reading that verse in 1 Samuel, not just looking at it, but when he came to truly consider it. Mm. Just like it's commanded, right? To consider it. And when he began considering the great things that the Lord had done for him, then all of a sudden, it's not, not about, oh, I'm, I was a Pharisee, I was an Israelite. Now what it's about is in Romans 8, 31, 32, and 3, he says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, 
how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. All of a sudden, the perspective is entirely different. Mm. It's not about what a great religious person I was, all the things I know. It's about the fact that God knows me. Right. right? Everything depends on your perspective. I, I, I think I shared this before, but I'm not certain. Uh, Alice and I are both from New York. She was born in the city, and I was raised in the beginning in the city. And my dad was in the hotel business. I lived in hotels. I lived in 10 Park Avenue, which is a, a, a posh hotel. It was on the corner of, and this may not mean anything to you, Park Avenue and 34th Street. But what that was was one long city block away from the Empire State Building. And at that time, in my youth, the Empire State Building was the biggest, the tallest building in the world. So I can remember my mother would take me over. We occasionally, you know, we'd go over. She'd take me to the Empire State and we'd go up to the cafeteria and have lunch there. And I, I just have this memory of being at the bottom of the Empire State Building and looking up and looking up and looking up and looking up. And, looking up. Looking up. and it's like it goes on forever. It's, it's like it just never top. ends. Yeah, you can't see the top when you're... You can't. I mean, it just goes on forever. But then, you know, I flew as an air crewman in the Navy. I had the opportunity to fly into and over the city so many times. And at 35,000 feet, you look down and you say, what Empire State right, Building? Right. You know? Now, the building didn't get smaller. It didn't get shorter. It didn't shrink. Nope. The only thing that changed was my perspective. When I was looking at it from street level, or worse, if you're looking at it from the gutter, gutter. you look, it goes on forever. If you're looking at it from 35,000 feet, you say, where is it? That's seated in heavenly places. And we're not supposed to be at street level. We're not supposed to be in the gutter. Right. We are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So when you look at things, all of a sudden it puts them in a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So you're, the greatest problem going on in your life, if you're looking at it from the gutter, it's going to look like it's going on forever and ever. But if you're looking at it from that place where you are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, say, what problem? And that's God's purpose in our lives, is that we would have that understanding and have that perspective. You know, I don't know if you know the account in Second Kings, when the Armenians, uh, they, that's the Syrians, okay? They were at war with Israel. And the Lord was giving Elisha, the prophet, information about what the king of Syria was planning to do. And he would pass it on to the king of Israel, and they were always prepared and were winning these battles. Inside information. Inside, uh, very inside information. So the king of Syria said, what's going on here? I'm paraphrasing, by the way. Mm -hmm. Who's know, the spy within uh, our midst? Yeah, there must be a spy. And somebody said to him, no, there's a prophet in Israel. So what he did was he sent an army hmm. after Elisha. And it says in 2 Kings chapter 6, I'm reading from starting at verse 14. And he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servants said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered him and said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire, chariots of fire all around Elisha. God had him surrounded. God had the enemy surrounded. But Elisha had to pray for his servant that God would open his eyes, that he would see. Now, you know what? Those, those fiery chariots, they were there, weren't they? Yes, they were. But this man wasn't seeing them mm -mm. until Elisha prayed that his eyes would be opened. We need to have our spiritual eyes opened to see the fact that God is in charge. Mm -hmm. He's in control. All that's, right. a, that's a praising thing spiritually. Well, then the question is, do you see problems or do you see adventures in your life? Do you see an opportunity? Because every, every what you would call a problem 
becomes an adventure, and every adventure becomes a victory, an opportunity for God to be glorified. That's the attitude. It's, it, your attitude has to change. Well, I'm, let me you ask have you this. Have you ever that. seen the enemy at work in your life coming against you? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Well, it says many of the afflictions of the righteous, right? So I'm sure you have. But has the Lord opened your eyes so that you see the chariots of fire and know that you're saved? Because it says he will deliver us out of them all. That's right. Do you see the truth that Paul saw? Do you see this? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Right? I'm telling you, it's all there in Romans. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I truly believe that Paul had that understanding when he considered, considered. that he was supposed to, when he was supposed to consider the great things that God has done. Mm-hmm. So then Paul, he continues on and says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Yes. Romans 8.31. It's not a matter of struggling to walk in the victory of Jesus Christ. It's about coming to understand that we already have the victory in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's all a matter of perspective. You know, I was thinking about this today and I mentioned to Alice. Alice and I, way back in uh, probably 1976 or 77, had the opportunity. We met a fellow named Harold Hill. Have, have you heard of Harold Hill? He wrote a book. He, well, he's written a number of books. Yeah. And I, I think the one that was his very bestseller was How to Live Like a King's Kid. Mm-hmm. Now, Harold Hill was a very brilliant man. He was a very successful engineer, a, an incredible mind. Uh, but he says that he was another failure, basically, because he was an alcoholic. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Until he encountered God, opened his eyes so that he could see Jesus Christ. Amen. That changed everything. So this book, How to Live Like a King's Kid, is just a, a group of small testimonies about things that God did in his life. Mm-hmm. But the thing, and as I say, we met him back then. That's a long time ago now. He uh, was, what, 70? He was old. Really, yeah, he was yeah, when old. we met him, he was old. 70s. Wait a minute, he was younger then than I am now. <laughs> okay. Okay. He was our age now, yeah. that we are now. But what a delightful, delightful man mm-hmm. because of the way he saw everything. Yes. But something he said just struck me so much. It's like when something goes wrong, do you start moaning and groaning and complaining and say, oh, Lord, save me? Or do you say, what's in this for you, Lord? Mm-hmm. What's in this for you? How can you be, be glorified, glorified, Lord? Amen. And over and over and over, he talked about how when he had that attitude, when he had that perspective, looking at his problems as opportunities for God to be glorified, you know what happened? God was glorified. That's right. That's the attitude of the righteous. It is. Because that should be our great desire, mm. is to see God exalted, to see God glorified. Okay? Think about what it says in Ephesians 1.18, when Paul prayed for the Christians at Ephesus. Mm. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? We need to pray that God opens our eyes. Yes. Well, but that means having a spiritual appraisal of things. Mm-hmm. It's not about having 20-20 vision. It's about seeing things spiritually, seeing the spiritual truth. It's there. And it's like, it's like Elisha at Dothan. The chariots, the chariots were there, yeah. but the servant couldn't see him until, the, until God opened his eyes to see them. We need to have our eyes open that God always has a purpose and a plan. And his plan for us is a plan for life, right? And he is faithful. Well, what, how much more clear could this be? Mm. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in, second, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, but a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is a spirit spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. And, you know, we talked about this. You ever, uh, if you were going to go sell a diamond or buy a diamond or whatever, you know, you take a diamond into a jeweler. The first thing he does is he takes out a loop. That's that magnifying mm-hmm. glass or eye piece that he has. And he studies that. And he looks, I'm not a diamond guy, but 
you know, he looks at, what is it? The, the, the facets. The carriage, the, carrots, the cut, cut, the yeah, clarity, clarity, and the color. Oh, that was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. But he has to, he, he can't just glance at it and say, he takes that loop and he, he considers it carefully, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, we need to do that, but the loop that we have is the Word of God. Yes. We need to look at everything and appraise everything through the Word of God if we are going to see the truth. Okay. Otherwise, you're seeing something false. If you want to see God at work. If you want to see God at work, all right? There's a big, big difference, like I said, between looking at something and considering something. Yes. I looked at the moon and the stars. Have you ever seen the moon and the stars? Yes. Have you all seen the moon and the stars? Before I was saved, I looked at the moon and stars, and it used to make me miserable. It used to upset me. You were considering them. I, well, I was, I was looking at them, and what I saw was it made me feel so insignificant because I was filled with pride, mm -hmm. and I thought so highly of myself. And then I would look at the moon and the stars. I'd look at the stars and think, my goodness, I'm looking at the light that came 50 gazillion years away. You know, and if I lived it back then, I was thinking if I lived to be 50, that would be a, a, a real amazing treat. So, I mean, that used to literally... I, I, it depressed you. It did. It, it used to depress me. I mean, I was, I was pretty successful in life. I mean, we were the original yuppies, I think. We had, a, you know, a lovely home in the suburbs of New York City. Had the luxury car, the sports car. Had all this stuff. And I, I'd go out and look at the stars and get depressed. That was until I encountered the Lord and he spoke to me and said this. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Psalm 8, verses 3 through 6. God's, and when I, I, this is, I sat down one day at my kitchen table. Now, I'd been, I had been raised in a church all my life. I was never, I was religious here and there. I never had a relationship with God. And I said, Jesus, if you're real, I want to know. And Alice had brought a Bible into our house. So I'd never read the Bible. And I went and I flipped it open. And that's exactly what I looked at, that verse. And I heard the voice of God say to me, not only am I real, but I know exactly what's in your heart. Right. That was the end of my life as I knew it. And I had new life. Praise oh, God. <laughs> well, you know, it's, Jesus said in John 16, 20, you will be sorrowful. I was sorrowful. Mm -hmm. He said, you'll be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Into joy. Amen. It certainly was. <laughs> and it certainly was. And then... Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Behold, the birds of the air. Mm. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Matthew 6, 26. Mm. Have you ever actually done that? Because the word behold doesn't just mean it's like the word consider. It means to look carefully, to, to truly evaluate. Really. You've all seen birds. <clears throat> Did you ever... Get to the place where you did what Jesus said and you behold what the message is. What's the message? When you look, what's your perspective? That if God takes care of them the way he takes care of them, are you not worth much more than them? Absolutely. So the question becomes, how much are you worth? Well, you know what you, you're worth? Yes. Anything is worth what somebody was willing to pay for it. If you have a car and you want to sell the car and you think it's worth $4,000 and nobody will give you more than $3,000, how much is it worth? $3,000. What establishes value is what somebody's willing to pay. Well, it says that you were purchased. You're not your own. You were purchased with a price. What was the price? The price was God the Father paid Jesus Christ to redeem you. That's how much you're worth. That should come when you understand. You should be rejoicing about the birds. Mm -hmm. Alice and I were in England, and we had just purchased a car over in England. And it was a nice car. It was a used car, you know, probably. We had it all cleaned but up. But it was all cleaned up and looking pretty. Mm -hmm. 
And we went out like the first morning, and there was bird poo all over the windshield. And I said, that's great. That just goes to prove that God's word is true. And now I said, said, what? (laughs) What? Yeah, God feeds the birds. It's all about the way you look at things. I mean, you can get miserable or you can get joyful. And you want to know something? It's all about how you see what's going on in your life. All right? Is that extracting the precious from the worthless? It is extracting the precious from the worthless. There's so much about this in Scripture. But it comes to, you know, that we have to choose to see what God is doing. Not what the enemy is doing. He's been defeated already. And that we have a place where to set our mind on the things above. Is that not true? Absolutely. We're to store up our treasures in heaven. What's he got to the, that he can hurt you here? And the promise is that he will watch over you, give you victory. Victory can come at the cost of your natural life too, by the way. So, Praise God. When you look at the enemies that surround you, do you see somebody who is a threat to you? A threat to your happiness? A threat to your abundant life? Or do you see a person who, by the amazing grace of God, might become an eternal brother or sister? Mm. I don't think that's what we think when we see our enemies. Then we better better train ourselves Mm -hmm. to see things spiritually. That's right. Because, you see, if that person gets saved, he'd get saved by the same amazing grace that saved you and I when we were unsaved sinners. Mm. The enemies of the gospel. You were a dirty, rotten sinner. There isn't any other kind. There's no nice sin. There's no clean sin. (laughs) And we were all sinners, saved by the grace of God. We need to start seeing things differently. How, How else could you possibly pray for your enemies? You know, that's the, that's the only prayer, the ultimate prayer for their salvation. And I, I understand that this can be difficult and natural. It was certainly difficult for the early church to believe, to comprehend the fact that Paul, this man who was out persecuting the church, was all of a sudden a giant of the church. Right. They had to well, change. They, yeah, the church was very fearful when he yeah, first. They had to change the way they saw Paul. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Because Paul changed the way he saw them, right? Amen. Yes. We have to see him as he is so that we will be as he is. That's the promise, isn't it? Yes. When we see him as he is, we will be as he is. Yes. Your perspective will determine your attitude. The way you say things is going to determine the attitude you have. And your attitude determines your altitude. Hallelujah. Mm. If you're going to walk on the high places and seeing clearly the great things that the Lord has done for you, will give you perseverance. So make sure you're with us next week when we start talking about persevering, perseverance. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the great gifts that you give us. We thank you, Lord God, for all of the things that you have done in our life, the things that you have done, the things that you are doing, and the things that you are yet to do. But Father, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we would see that triumph in Christ Jesus now for the glory of your name. Amen and amen. Amen. Till next time. You have nothing you want to say? Jesus loves you. <laughs> A lot. God bless you. Bye. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days. I want to praise the wonders of your mind.